the, the countdown. Ten, nine. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start. Okay. So, um, of course, this week we're covering Lecture Module 4, which has Chapter 4 in it, an associated quiz, and then Linux Lab 4. Chapter 4, to me and to, to many people, is actually one of the easiest chapters in the, in the book. Why? Input and output. It presents the devices that we use daily. Um, it does present some emergent technologies, input and output, but it, it kind of falls short there. So we have one of our best classes probably tomorrow um, when we get to look at emergent input and output. So what do we know? Okay, let's go back to day one, input processing and output. Okay, so it's fundamental to the computing process that we um, undertake every day. Input and output can even be more important than the processing that takes place. There is a software engineering tenet that states, if users can't find the functionality, it may as well not exist. Right? So you create this great application that does this wonderful thing, but if nobody can use it, what's the point? Okay? So what we're talking about here is input-output. And that's really input-output from a systems design standpoint. Right, right now we're looking at input-output from a physical standpoint, physical devices. And I don't, I don't know if anybody recalls, does anybody recall the two principles of the technology acceptance model? I don't expect you to, but someone might hear. Okay. The technology acceptance model, two main components. There's perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. If something is just easy to use, everyone will use it. And when I say easy to use, what am I really talking about? Input and output. Okay. Input and output is that human computer interface, HCI. You also see user interface, UI, okay? because how do we as humans access the computer? Okay. So let's get into this. Okay. Keyboards. I don't think I'm going to say a single thing on keyboards. Again, I'm pretty sure everyone here has used a keyboard. Um, but what I will introduce now, because where are we going? We're moving more and more towards mobile computing. So if we look at that mobile device, our phones, the tablets are kind of different, but still they, they suffer from some of the same shortcomings. So if I look at a phone, what is it constrained by? Well, input and output. Tiny little screen, right? And we're going to learn something in web design. When we go to web design, right now, if we have limited resources, we develop for mobile first. Why? 60% of all web access now is done from a mobile phone. So, and many organizations are not acknowledging that. So what do they, they develop a website which is great on a PC, okay, but on a phone what do we have to do? Something we call pinch and zoom hell, okay, right? Why? I have this image up, I scroll out, I try to make it bigger, okay, but now I'm, I have this little perspective, I'm a mouse in the maze, right? I'm kind of dragging around, is this it, is this it, is this it? And it's very hard to use. So when we look at mobile computing, input and output, one of the shortcomings of the mobile device is the keyboard, okay? There's no way I'm writing a paper with these fat thumbs on a little text keyboard. It's not happening. Um, we're going to see tomorrow some emergent technology um, that will actually overcome this. I'm going to show you a holographic keyboard. And that's really where we're heading is this, this phone that becomes the ubiquitous device that becomes our main computing platform. Um, and there are many things that are going to get us to there. I like the one that displays like, <laughs> it's like an infrared kind of holographic. Kind of yes. Like this. Yep. And it detects using lasers and yeah other technologies. Does it work though? You're gonna see. It oh. works great. Yeah. <laughs> you I mean, I type like 85 words a minute. Can you still do that now? Yeah. You know, I don't know. Again, I, I'm a fast typist yeah. as well. But on say a, my iPad, yeah, I I slow down <laughs> considerably. Um, but that's where maybe voice input comes into play. Um, pointing devices. <clears throat> now we can look at this from two dimensions. Um, if you look at the early PDAs in the late 90s, the personal digital assistants, you know, this was before they actually converged with the cell phone. Um, they all had styluses, okay? Um, and then they kind of went by the wayside because everybody lost their stylus, okay? <laughs> um, Samsung, of course, has come out with the new phones and now they have the stylus again. Um, and styluses are great for, well, graphics. Anybody do any graphics here with like a touchpad or anything? Graphics, tablet. Um, and they're, they're great for those types of 
applications. For me, a stylus will never be useful because there's no way, there's no computer powerful enough in the world to understand my handwriting. Nobody is doing that recognition. Um, so for me, a stylus isn't going to really help me. I have heard, it's been leaked, that the next iPads, and of course you can get a stylus for an iPad now, um, but the I next iPads may actually ship with a stylus. So kind of interesting. Um, touch screens, of course, are the future. We all have them on our cell phones. They are our tablets. We're seeing them in some laptops. And Apple has applied for, I think, for some patents. Um, so the next um, Apple notebooks may be full touch screens, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> Mice. Well, we've all used a mouse. So I'm not going to say much here either. Um, and I forget, how many Apple users do we have here? Do we have any Apple? Anybody have an Apple mouse? Um, I'll try to remember to bring. What's that? You used to? No, but the new Apple Mouse, the new um, touch-based one. Um, I'll try to remember to bring it in um, tomorrow. The Apple Mouse, the new one, um, wireless, doesn't have any buttons. The entire surface is a button. The entire surface. The entire surface is a touchpad, so you can scroll and you can do multi-gesture touches. You know, two, three fingers just on the surface. When you first try it, I, when I first tried it, I didn't like it at all because, of course, I'm used to, you know, the Microsoft mouse, two, three buttons. And then I used it, forced myself to use it for a day, and I found it's better. You know, I can to sit there. I don't have to move it across the table. I can control the cursor just with a finger or scroll up and down, you know, documents with two fingers without ever having to move it. You know, I always, I'm always running out of space. You know, I'm trying to drag something and I'll hit a book on my, on my desk or something. So the ability to do that without moving the mouse is very nice. Um, and I'll bring that in tomorrow. Hopefully I'll remember. OK, pen styluses I won't go into um, in more detail. Digital writing systems, yeah, they're nice if they can recognize your writing. Um, we're actually much better. The industry is much better at understanding your voice. And we'll talk about voice recognition in just a minute. Um, so, touch screens, of course, were there. Um, interesting thing on Surface Computing, just a kind of little sidebar here. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers, Microsoft came out with this really beautiful Surface Computer. Um, very big, it was probably a 60 inch monitor or so. Um, and it really just sat in the middle of the table. And when we built this lab, I looked at getting one for this lab, because you could just throw pictures down on it. It would scan them immediately. You could just move things around. Um, but we didn't get one, because I, I was trying to think of uses for it. How would we use this in education? And it kind of reaffirms a lesson. In CIS, one of the things that and we're going we're gonna to be tempted to do this, new technology will come out, and we love technology. I love technology. I shouldn't speak for it. And it's like, oh, i got to have that. I'll find a use for it. And that is the last thing that we can do in IT. Why? It costs money. I can't just waste money frivol frivolously. So I was thinking about getting the Surface computer. And then after about six months, I really couldn't find a use for it. How would I use this in teaching and education? You know? So it's, it's kind of just a reaffirms the fact that when technology comes out, yeah, we're going to love it. But we shouldn't just race out and buy it just for the sake of it being new, cool technology. Uh, now, tomorrow, we're going to see some cool technology that you know, we're going to have to have. So. But that, that's kind of different. Scanners. Okay. For the consumer, I can't imagine why a, a person would ever buy another scanner. Um, we have that functionality on our phones, on our tablets. Is anybody using scanner apps on their phone or not really? I did. I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so whether you're Android or iPhone, go to the App Store, search for it, buy it, get a free one. Um, I have several on my iPhone um, to where they will scan any document, and for free, they'll even do optical character recognition. So you think about this. We're in education, okay? We are continually trying to find new material. But you think about this in business, too, documents, okay, things of this nature. Um, so I'm in the library. I find an article I like. I have my phone with me. I scan it. It automatically converts it, optical character recognition, to text. So I can actually grab parts of it and quote directly. I've just saved myself so much time. 
Okay? You think about businesses. Um, another thing that's, I think, obsolete is fax machines. Um, Google has, they purchased, um, what's the, they purchased a fax company for electronic faxing. But with the combination of that now is with my phone, I could, you know, a contract. I could scan it, I could sign it, I could scan it, and I could immediately fax it without it ever going to paper, paper through my possession. Okay? So this is really where we're going. Um, so again, I do recommend, if you don't have a scanner on your phone, get one. They're free. Um, you never know when you want to scan something out there and save it. Okay? Come across some article, uh, and this is the way business is being done. Now, when we do talk about scanning, what we're doing is, of course, we have some image, and I'm overlaying a grid on it. Okay? And then for each cell in the grid, I'm sampling what are the color components, the red, blue, green components. Okay? Of course, as I increase the dots per inch, the cells become smaller, so I'm going to more accurately represent the image or convert the image that I'm, that I'm scanning to digital format. Okay? So that's DPI. Um, in the book, you, can, you can't really see it on this screen, but in the book you can actually see very well the difference as I increase resolution or dots per inch, that the resolution, the clarity of the picture does increase. So we have scanning, and scanning is that functionality. Okay? But the application space, there are many different applications that I can apply scanning to. Barcode readers. Anybody, anybody using barcode readers on their phone? What do you use it for? Yep. Good. I, I recommend it. Um, two years ago, um, I have a daughter, um, and we went Christmas shopping, and you know, Toys R Us, all this, whatever. Um, we brought we brought my iPad. And we just started scanning, just to see. Because, of course, when you're in the store, you can actually see things. So, okay, very hard to just determine what it is when you're on, you know, online. And literally, the, the scanner I have, I forget which one it is, um, and it gets, you know, best prices, and it invariably turned out to be Amazon in, like, every instance. <laughs> so we're out there, and we're scanning it, and you, you'd scan it, and you would pull it up, and there's Amazon's price, like, $20 cheaper. And literally, we said, add to cart. We didn't buy a single thing that day. Um, we probably saved, I think we spent we spent a little under two hundred dollars, but we saved like two hundred dollars. It was unbelievable. Um, yeah. <laughs> Come on, slap your wrist. Oh sure. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to uh, information systems and business. Some of these brick and mortars. And Best Buy, they do very well online, too. Um, I'm not sure how some of these big places are going to stay in business. You know, Russell, isn't that kind of the death of the company that you're using? Because you're going out there, uh, you're not actually using the product, but you're using them just to find the item that you want. But eventually, that system's going to kind of fail because yes, you're, you're right. out of business. Yep, you're right. So, um, yeah. So we're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. Yes. <laughs> as long as you get what you want. I acknowledge that, yep. So save money now. Um, so many different codes. Um, so you just mentioned QR codes. QR codes, one of the things, and I present this later, but I'll introduce it now. Um, marketing and IT have converged. And largely, marketing doesn't, well, a lot of marketing doesn't understand this. They don't apply it. Okay, you know, we still listen to the radio, but in marketing, all of business today is all about analytics. Okay, it's all about measurements. Okay, and that's really what analytics is. Analytics goes beyond that into predictive analysis, and we're going to cover that as well. But if you think about the radio ad, you know, I'm going to tell you buy this, whatever. Okay, there's no way to measure how many people heard that radio ad and actually purchased the product. You know. The marketing company will say, oh, you know, you're, you're broadcasting to 20,000 people and whatever. Um, and then sales go up, oh, see? But, the, but there's no direct correlation. There's no, there's no analysis there. There's analysis. It's maybe inappropriate. 
Uh, whereas when we move to, say, a QR code, let me show you the difference. Now, there are ways in Radio Ads you'll hear, um, you know, go to this website and enter, you know, Mike in the promo code. Okay. What that does is now, because it's going through a website, where did they hear Mike? They can trace it back to the radio, okay? But do, do you have any idea when it broadcast? Okay, someone heard it at different times, okay? And so you still don't know what population you just hit, okay? All you know is they heard it on the radio, okay? Did they hear it yesterday, a week ago? Or did someone walk up to them, you know, I heard this on the radio this morning and used, you know, so the person may not have even heard it on the radio. Let's look at, say, a QR code. Now, I'm going to put something, a banner, you know, and, and granted, by the way, you use QR codes. How many other people? It, we're, we're in the minority. It's much bigger overseas, you know. Um, so, again, cross games. I put up a banner, okay, for some product, whatever. And I put a QR code there. And, of course, now someone comes by. If they snap the code, what have I captured? Well, I've encoded, say, a website there. So their phone, okay, went to that site. Through JavaScript, the site can detect what kind of phone are you on, okay? iPhone or Android. Okay. What time? Maybe five people snapped it right in a row, you know, cross gates at 10, 15 a.m., okay, on a school day. Well, likely or hopefully it's not, you know, kids who should be in school. So that, I, again, identifies kind of a target population, you know, stay-at-home moms, dads, whatever, okay? There's a whole lot of information that I can now get because there are many cases where marketing, you know, they've developed some product, you know, look at the, um, was it the Element? Was that the Honda Element? You know, and they came out that car, and they wanted it to be, you know, for the young crowd of surfers and things like that. Wrong. Nope, they didn't buy it. Um, but who did is moms, and, you know, it became the new, like, you know, minivan. Um, so if you can actually detect that, a change in the market, and then change your marketing and market to a different population, you still actually get to capture some of the revenue that you expected. So this is all about marketing. Marketing has gone to, you know, their buzzwords out there, social media, things like that. But there's far more into it that a lot of marketing doesn't get these days. I just added that. That's the uh, QR code for CISS100.com. So, um, and there are, again, we talk about business IT society, okay? Um, we, as the consumer, have to be aware because, yes, this could have security implications, okay? If that was to a website that maybe downloaded, you know, spyware, adware, okay? So as a consumer, we need to be aware of this. And again, the U.S., we are largely behind other countries in our understanding and really our computer science education. Okay, RFID. RFID, there are two types of technologies with radio frequency identification readers and tags. There's active and passive. Okay, an active RFID will actually transmit a signal, okay? So if it's transmitting a signal, of course, it needs a power source, okay? It's going to be more expensive, okay? And there are great applications for that. Passive RFID readers have to be scanned, so there has to be an energy transfer to actually get, and get that information and read the code back. Now, let's look at some of the application space. Um, RFID tags have great applications, especially when it comes to supply chain management. I'll use the Walmart example. Uh, shake my head, the Walmart example. Um, you know, you have a pallet of lettuce, and Walmart uses RFID codes extensively. And the pallet of lettuce has an RFID tag. You know? And in there, where it came from, when it was harvested, maybe even what its shelf life is, and a snowstorm comes up. So now it's stuck in a distribution center. Okay, it's not getting to where it has to go to Maine. It's not getting there. It's snowed in. So someone comes along and reads it, and they're able to detect that it's okay, and this is going to go bad in two days. There's no way I'm getting this to Maine. If I try to ship it to Maine, it's going bad. I'm losing all of my money on it. But RFID, I can quickly learn that and say, well, you know, if I send it to this local store, blow it out, red dot special or whatever they're calling it these days and sell it for like half cost, at least I get some money back, okay? So RFID tags allow us really facilitate or enhance supply chain management. 
They're doing this, of course, with UPS, FedEx, all of these things. If I can understand where all of these items are in the course of their travels, I can do things far more efficiently. OK, what about the consumer? Um, they started putting RFID, and they're, they're relatively expensive now, um, chips in, say, corks to wine bottles. This was done out, out in California. So you're in a you know big superstore, wine store, whatever, um, and you're adding you add a bottle, you know wine bottle to your shopping cart, and the shopping cart has a display. It reads the RFID tag, and then brings up the information from Wine Spectator, speculator, whatever it is. Um, you can tell I don't drink a lot of wine, um, and it tells me about the wine. Okay, great. Um, and as I add bottles of wine to my cart, it also keeps a running tally of how much I'm going to owe upon checkout. Or it could even be automated checkout. I just kind of walk out and it charges my credit card. Um, so there are great applications here. But I brought, this, I brought this up because what do we have to be concerned with? Business, IT, society, triangle. Okay, All these great applications. Okay. There was a luggage company that started putting RFID chips into its high-end luggage. Okay. And this is not luggage for me. You know, this is fifteen hundred dollar luggage. Um, it's more for the person who flies in, walks to their you know chauffeur driven car, and the chauffeur picks up the luggage from the from the um, turnstile because they can sta stand there and say, "Oh, this is the luggage," because they're not visually identifying it. Okay, but of course, okay, now we have these chips in the luggage. Okay, this is high end luggage, fifteen hundred dollars a suitcase. What do you think is in the art is in these suitcases? Nice, good stuff. So crooks quickly learned, hey, they're doing this. I can walk around the airport with my RFID scan. Oh, there's one right there. I'm grabbing that $1,500 suitcase because what's likely inside it is worth a lot of money as well. Okay. So again, whenever we have a new technology, there are going to be changes to business or society and vice versa. We're going to look at that again in just another minute. OK, so RFID tags have great applications. Um, you know, electronic tolls there. Of course, these are our easy pass, um, things like that, um, tracking patients in hospitals. And one of the things that this text doesn't go into, we're going to look at in this course, is robotics. Um, I haven't really spoken much about robotics, but we're going to have big changes in society due to robotics. Okay? In hospitals, they have robots that are del delivering meals and medications. Um, People are losing jobs. And there are advocates that say, oh, it's going to give people more leisure time. Well, yeah, OK, <laughs> whatever. Um, I kind of see the divide getting larger between the haves and have-nots. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of concerned at this. The only thing we call it Wally? Yes. Yeah. Kind of like that. Are you but kidding? Just... My daughter's, one of my daughter's favorite movies growing up. It was actually a movie that I could watch too at the same time. But we could talk about Wally. Um, how many people have seen Wally? When was the last time you seen it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's great. Oh, it's fantastic. Now go back and listen. What is Wally's boot up sound, and what is Eve's boot up sound? Next time you watch, Wally boots to a Windows yeah. boot up sound. He boots with maples and apples, <laughs> um, which is kind of telling too. Um, poking a little fun there. Um, optical mark readers. Well, again, we're kind of moving more towards just a general scanning um, capability and the ability to actually perform this optical character character recognition. Um, and it's funny we talk about. I'm going to actually talk about a couple items here that are essentially they had. A, a lifespan of like a year or two. Um, magnetic ink character recognition, they're still used, um, but largely they're becoming obsolete. Why? Because now I can take an image of a check with my iPhone and deposit it. You know, you look at the, the new ATMs, it's just all done through just general scanning rather than optical um, or magnetic ink character recognition. Okay, biometric. Biometric. I introduced something we're going to revisit when we come to operating systems and security. Um, identification, authentication, and authorization. 
Okay. So what I'm really talking about is security. There are three le levels of identification. The lowest level, and again, I'll, I'll, re I'll present this again, okay? but I wanted to give it out now because if I say it a few times, people will remember. Uh, the lowest level of identification, how I identify to a system, is something I know. This is what we use for the most part. Username, password, right? I put my username in, a password, and I identify myself or the system identifies me as that user. Now, of course, this can be spoofed or hacked pretty easily. Um, a little bit more secure is something I have. So now if I have a USB dongle or on my you know, ID card here, I have an RFID chip, and the system scans it. Because now the system, you know, I have to have this in my possession. And typically, we'll use two-factor authentication at this point, identification. Um, to where I need two things. I need the, my RFID chip and my, uh, my ID tag here and I'll input my username and a password. Two-factor. Second level. The, the highest level is biometrics, something I am. Okay? A, a fingerprint, a retina scan. Okay? Because hopefully, say, hopefully I'm not in a James Bond movie and someone's not taking my finger or retina. Okay? <laughs> it's very hard to spoof this. Okay? So again, three levels. Something I know, okay? username and password. A little bit higher, something I have, and again, I'd use this with two-factor authentication, so something I have plus username and password, and then, of course, the highest level of identification, something I am, okay? And this can be a lot of things. We're doing that with uh, voice, a bunch, bunch of things now, face recognition. So there are a lot of emergent uh, technologies here. CES this year had a, a retinal scanner that they were showing off for about 99 bucks. Yeah. I've always been interested in the retinal scan stuff. Incredible. Um, you know, and these are the things you'll hear me state over and over. It's our job to remain abreast of technology, remain relevant. And you never know, you know, when you'll be asked to do security, create a security for system for a company, an organization. And just knowing that there is a $99 retina scan out there <laughs> is fantastic. Think about it. It's fantastic. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, digital cameras. Now, here's a question. The standalone digital camera. Is anyone here in this room ever buying another digital camera, standalone digital camera? Photographers? Yeah. So you'll, you'll still get photographers doing it, but for the general consumer, I, I will, well, actually, I'll, I actually have something new, and I'll tell you about it a little later. <laughs> but, but it's a whole different thing. Um, and there's, again, a change in some new technology, of course, the convergence of the cell phone and the camera has resulted in changes to business. I think I told you the Chicago Tribune last summer fired all of its staff photographers, right? Doesn't need them anymore. It has their reporters take pictures using their iPhones because they're good enough. The resolution has, has risen on all of these phones to be good enough for publication. So a change in business because of technology. Business, IT, society, that triangle again. Um, what I'm going to show you tomorrow, again, another item I have to remember to put in my bag as soon as I get back to the office because I'll forget it, is the Lytro camera. I don't know if anyone's seen it here. L-Y-T-R-O. Okay. Historical, traditional cameras, we're talking about digital cameras. Of course, there's an image. It's a very similar to a scanner. It superimposes a grid and then samples each cell in the grid to get the RGB, the, the, the color components. The Lytro camera, it looks very different. You'll see tomorrow. What it does is it captures the light vector field. What it does essentially allows you to produce a 3D image. By capturing the light vectors, you can actually refocus after the fact. So you don't even focus. You hold the camera up and you click. That's it. All right. And what you do is after the fact, you import the image and it's captured all the light vectors and then you can say, focus on the flower. Repeat over here. And it'll bring into focus everything else goes out of focus. Or focus on the seagull flying in the air 200 feet, 300 feet away. You click on that. The seagull comes into focus. Um, this is great. Right? Okay. You can think of 
positive. Okay? I, I immediately thought of as soon as this came in, well, actually it came out prior to this, but um, the Boston Marathon bombing. Okay? If one person had taken a shot using the Lytro camera, they would have said, focus on that individual. APB is out a minute and a half later. What did we have to do? We had to send all of these, you know, collect all these images, photos from everyone, send them off to, F to the FBI headquarters down in Quantico, and they did all this, you know, cost a lot of money, you know, extrapolation, interpretation, things like that, um, to come up with an image of who it might be. They kind of look like this. This is our best, you know. So you think about how this is going to change, okay, the film industry. You know, now I have, you know, ten cameras up and we're filming some scene, and you better catch it. And they're not quite too motion picture filming in this, but they're going to be there soon. Now you set up, you know, 15 of these, you just capture everything. After the fact, let's focus on this. You just capture everything. Okay, that's great. Wonderful. What else do we have coming, though? Drones, right? Drones in the air. You start putting these cameras on drones, nothing we do will be private, ever, ever again. I was about to say, like, I was watching the news, and they were showing images from, like, government drones, and they said that the quality of the images was lowered so that we wouldn't know, like, how much they were. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> as soon as you put a Lytro camera on these things, it's going to be scary. Yeah. You know? And we've always seen this in the movies, you know, in the crime scene investigation, all these things. Like, let's enhance this. And a lot of it is, you know, you know hokey, I guess. Yeah. But, but that is now going to be realized. Um... So we'll we'll talk about that. That that's coming in for security and privacy. On the other hand, how how close do they get? I mean, can they capture a credit card from? What the what 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 the government can do with satellites now? No, no, yeah. I meant like just the light drum. The light drum. Like, yes, again, it, it's a consumer device. Okay, but the technology is here. So um, the consumer. Oh, they just cut the price on it now too. I think for Valentine's Day you can get it for two ninety nine. Um, but I'll bring it in. Uh, and I, I think it's pink, too, um, what I saw. Um, but I'll bring it in tomorrow, and we'll look at it. We'll look at some videos. And Again, tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be a lot of fun. You don't need to capture the image of it. Uh, criminals are actually using RFID technology to steal the information just by walking by you. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why they sell those RFID wallets now. They're in metal. Because yep. I've got JCPenney uh, up and running on their RFID yep. for my store. I was their tech nerd. And they were like, here. And they hand me this giant box of crap they were shipped. Yep. So I had to get everything rolling. And so I know a lot about the RFID technology because That's of great. that. Very interesting. I thought about stealing a whole roll of the little stickers. Yep. So I could just run and stick them randomly in places in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> when you scan and something's not attached the barcode yep. to the actual radio frequency, it comes up as an error. And I thought about giving them 500 random errors throughout the store. Stick on the bottom of things. All righty. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they put tracers in their guitars now. Like, uh, yeah. I was at the costume shop, and uh, I actually got to play Robert Plant's guitar. That was really cool. Very nice. He, he got, like... Very, very tiny. We're going right into audio. Yeah, and it's got like a little, a little tiny, like pill-shaped capsule. It's like some secret gifts of technology that tracks everything. It's got all of that. Great. Wow. Um, audio input. Okay. Again, you know, we're going mobile, and our mobile phones, I/O, you know, small screens, small keyboards, whatever we can do, especially with voice recognition. Um, and there are a couple different camps. There's again. There's a business perspective here um, as well. If I look at, say, Siri, and I don't like Siri. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm going back to Android just because Windows is coming out with their own Siri called Photonic. <laughs> <Really? laughs> just, just <laughs> That's right. I, 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 yeah, I, they're really going to name it after the new Halo. I actually, actually dismissed that before you even finish your sentence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. Windows voice recognition, Mac voice recognition. There's one in the industry, Dragon. Uh, when it comes to it, Dragon yeah. is incredible. I used to do a demonstration here in class, and I might at some point, depending on our time. Um, but now that there are a bunch of YouTube videos up, and I'll actually maybe show one tomorrow, um, or you can take a look at it. 
and Dragon just works, 99.9% .9 accuracy. My uh, girlfriend's a teacher, a uh, special ed teacher. She uses Dragon Diction for her students oh, and can't take notes. It's, just, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, if you are thinking grad school, buy it now, $99. The, the key thing is, um, <clears throat> a couple things actually, um, you should have a USB microphone. Because what you want is a very good conversion analog to digital. You know, that it starts there. It's only going to be as good as the conversion. Um, having said that, I could probably, I think, I dictate a full page, single space, wide margins or narrow margins um, in about eight minutes. So I can pretty much do a 12, 15 page paper in an hour, single space. You know, we're talking 30 pages, APA style. Um, but you think about how you can use it like in, in the library. You go in, you're just doing research, you throw the headset on and you're reading, and you come across a passage you want to keep, you read it. It's done. You're walking out with it. Now, of course, you can do that, of course, with a scanner in your iPhone, too, something like that. Um, now, moving back to mobile, um, two different camps. Again, Siri, and it's part of Apple's business model, it goes to the cloud. Of course, you need a cellular or Wi-Fi. So you dictate in, it goes up to a server, the server translates it, and it you know, presents you with the text back. Okay. Apple wants to do this, of course, because they get to see what you're saying. You know, there's, there's marketing, there's business value there. In contrast, um, Android, which is Linux, um, and it's the latest Linux, and it's actually now two versions of Linux. Um, the voice recognition is built into the Linux kernel. We know the kernel is that resident component of the operating system, the Linux operating system. So the latest Android versions do not need to send it up to, and it doesn't go up to the cloud. So it's done all there. So it's much more accurate. Um, it's much more responsive, and of course you don't need a signal. You could be out in a field with no cellular signal, no Wi-Fi, and you could dictate and write a paper. This to me is mobile computing. You know, I don't want to. I want to get rid of that Wi-Fi tether when necessary. So um, in this case, I think Android is clearly superior. Um, so I forget how many music musicians do we have in here? I have a couple. What do you? What do you use? Um, do you have an I.O.? Do you go yeah, into the computer? Yeah, I have a lot. Okay. Right now. I want to upgrade. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm on Sonar, and I've been on it. Pro Tools, too. Yeah. It's just mastery. Yeah. I, I got into music when I was on the Windows side, so Sonar, Kid Cakewalk, way back in the day. Um, so, audio input. And there are two different types. Of course, there's the waveform, and there's also MIDI. We'll look at MIDI as well. Uh, you can do a lot of good things with MIDI. It all depends on how good your MIDI engine is. Um, so we'll go into it here. Um, so display dev devices, again, these are evolving. Um, what's really interesting is the organic LEDs, OLEDs. Um, they're flexible. I'll show something tomorrow. Um, the first, I think they're shipping. The first OLED sh cell phones are shipping. Um, you can literally bend them. You can bend them, you know, 180 degrees, um, and we'll look at that, which is great because I've seen a bunch of people with, you know, broken screens. You can drop it on the floor. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm an owner um, of a broken screen device. Drop it on the floor, and nothing happens, you know? That's wonderful. Um, so I won't go into, you know, the flat panel displays, things like this. Um, OLEDs, and again, they're very thin. They use less power which, of course, for a cell phone is great. You know, if I can get longer battery life. Um, they say within a couple of years, we'll be able to have a television, flat screen TV, like a 60-inch or something, that you could essentially roll up and carry with you, you know, um, which is very cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, size and aspect ratio, again, we need to know this um, more from the consumer. But, of course, if you're putting a big, you know, screen into a um, conference room or something. Good to know. Um, and I actually look at these, and we're going to talk about these in just a minute, you know, the projectors that we have overhead. Projectors are very expensive. Okay, first of all, the bulbs themselves can be like $3,000, $5,000. Um, but especially these, these are both high resolution projectors in this room. Um, and, you know, what are we talking, 1080, you know, I or whatever. Um, and they're about $10,000 each, those projectors there. 
And you think about it. What kind of flat, you know, LED TV could I get for ten thousand dollars? You know, we're talking about sports bar, you know, huge TV. Um, so I look at that that screen there, and I look at the price of this, and very easily we could replace that with you know a huge flat screen TV. And then of course if um you know, someone someone's walking there, they're not you know interfering with the signal being projected. Um, and there are other emergent devices out here, um, Chromecast, Roku, you know, the Netgear devices, Miracast, things like this. Um, has anybody seen the Chromecast? Um, Do you? Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. It's this tiny USB dongle, I mean literally the size of my thumb. So you think about it, um, and business presentations are always difficult. You create this PowerPoint presentation or something, and you get to the place, and it, you know who knows how far away the projector is. Suddenly, the font is like nobody can read it because it's so small. Whereas with the Chromecast or something like this, it's going to display exactly what you have on your screen. So I'm walking in with a Chromecast. I'm plugging it into the TV, the HDMI port, and I'm going to do my presentation that way. I'm walking in literally with my iPhone and a Chromecast, uh, which is wonderful. Now the question is, what do you think of the Chromecast? Oh. I like it. I mean, it's thirty-five bucks. Thirty-five you know, bucks. My mom wanted something that she could play Netflix on, and like the, the best part is, like, you just take it. Like, you know, if I want to like go to this girl's house and watch a movie, I just grab it and go, and I have my phone with Netflix yep. on it, and it works. If I like watch something on YouTube, I can go, hey, go to you, you know, go to the TV and you can queue stuff up on the TV. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Traveling, spring break, whatever, you throw it in your, you know, on your. TV so and you your, your Netflix on your phone, yeah, you just use your phone as there. a device to like choose the movies. So. And and they did have when it first came out, they did have the ability to stream. What it does is, of course, mirrors essentially what's on your phone. Um, and then it had the ability to show, um, you know, files. And yeah, you, there is a workaround by the way. You still can still do it. Um, so if you have movies on your phone, iPad, computer, you just show them that way as well. By the way, I, I walked in, um, and I just got one. I just yeah. haven't. I walked into it because I wanted to evaluate it because it's an open API, and I actually wanted to do some programming on it. Um, and I'm in checkout, $35. And Best Buy is in be actually using Best Buy. Um, and they offered me a credit card and $20 off my purchase for the day, so I got it for $15. Uh, that was kind of nice. Um, display devices. Um, Again, we're talking about ports here. And again, this is this is changing. You know, VGA, DVI, HDMI. Well, of course, that you you know that Chromecast is an HDMI dongle, so to speak. Roku, all these things are. So now I could just present it wirelessly. You know, and there are a few different technologies, whether it's you know, Miracast, Bonjour, you know, we'll get into that um, when we get to networking. We don't really need to discuss that now. Um, not much to say there. Wearable displays, um, we're going to look at this tomorrow. Um, and a few different things here. Because now we're talking about augmented reality, um, Google Glass, and there are a few other things. MIT actually came out with a way to do it on any screen. In the last class, um, one student was telling me that they've come out with motorcycle helmets with you know, displays. And they'll actually have a window up there with a rear view camera. So the motorcyclist sees what's behind them, all kinds of things, voice recognition, GPS, things like this. And you know, the Google Glass came out. We're going to look at it tomorrow. We'll look at the, some, some videos on it. And I was like, well, nice, nice, you know, consumer device. OK, I get it. You know, you can meet your friends and check weather, and it will reroute you, and things like this. But then I started looking at other applications. Um, and I think I told you I was, I was a corpsman. Uh, Maybe. And one of the things that, you know, you're dealing with a critically injured person. Um, and there's always a time lag, you know, and if you're not working right at their head, um, you know, you're not always immediately aware if their heart stops, if they stop breathing, something like this. Um, to where the ability to walk up to a patient and slap a wireless EKG diode on their chest and then continue working and having your EKG monitor on, on my screen. You know, I may be working on something severe down in their lower extremities, and I know if their heart stops, it's not like I'm working here, oh look, are they still breathing? Working here, are they still breathing? Okay, 
It's constantly in my field of vision. Now take this another level. This, of course, can be transmitted back to the hospital. So a physician can actually see what the patient is doing or what's, what's wrong. And they can even give them guidance you know, to, to the EMT or something. Have a look at this. Please do this. Okay. So what it does is it, it just decre it enhances communication and you're just immediately aware of everything. So you think about this for pilots, all kinds of applications. The application space for um, augmented reality is actually huge. Okay, I won't talk much about LCDs. LEDs, of course, um, are a far better um, approach. And then, of course, the organic LEDs that we'll look at tomorrow. So, and there are many different special types of LEDs, okay, you know, flexible, transparent, things like that. Um, interferometric are kind of cool in that they work off or from external light. So they don't require that extra power. So for like, you know, displays outside for a museum, things like this, directions. Of course, I don't know how they do in darkness. Um, so they're limited. Um, projectors are one another thing. Yeah, they'll continue on. But I do see decreasing use from because of other uh, technologies. Although hologram projectors, we're going to look at a cell phone hologram, hologram projector tomorrow, which is very cool. Um, printers, again, I'm not going to go into printers. The one thing I am going to say about printers, we have to understand, we, we introduce this when we get to information systems analysis design, total cost of ownership, TCO. Okay? Whenever we make a purchase, we should think about TCO. I can get an inkjet printer for what these days? You know, $40, $50? That's, that's easy. Okay? What is the cost, the continuing cost, of buying inkjet cartridges? It's huge, okay? Where in contrast, a laser printer is more expensive up front, but they've come down. They're, they're almost a little over $100 now. But the service of each cartridge is much longer. So in the end, I'm actually going to pay less over the lifetime using a laser printer than an inkjet printer. So it's understanding total cost of ownership. You do need to address that and be aware of it. Um, print, speed, print speed, things like this, I'm not going to go into right now. Um, so, audio output, some real cool things going on in audio output. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen, there are devices that you can pretty much turn any object into a speaker. I don't know if you've seen these. Um, so we'll look at those tomorrow. Um, Harvard came out with a thin film, transparent, that is a speaker. But if it's not, if you don't have, you don't see the, you know, the things around holding it up, or you don't see what's behind it, or actually you can't even see what's behind it, but they, they put it there so you can see it, you don't even know it's there. So you're looking about just making an environment completely real, and literally your wall could be talking to you. Um, and we'll look at this tomorrow as well. Yeah. So, so that's it. Um, tomorrow's, again, if anybody knows of any emergent input-output, please let me know. Bring it tomorrow. Send me an email, whichever, and we'll take a look at it as well. Again, it's fronted by the holographic girl. Oh, the oh, the Japanese oh, oh, one, or yeah. um, the you know, Vocaloid, is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, it, they uh, they use Hasumiko from the Vocaloid.